Hi, my name is Ixchel Velasco Bravo and I'm going to talk about Mendelian randomization study of ACLY and cardiovascular disease. Here I leave you my social media so you can follow me. Content, definition, applications, pros and cons, issue in Ecuador and conclusion. Definition. ATP citrate lyse is a cytosolic enzyme widely expressed in lipogenic tissues such as, as liver and adipose tissue and has low expression levels in heart, small intestine, brain and skeletal muscle. Its overexpression is associated with various pathological conditions. The role of ACL in lipogenesis is to intervene previously in the synthesis of fatty acids through the production of acetyl-CoA. Note, historically, this enzyme has been considered a target pharmacology for the treatment of hyperlipidemias and hypercholesterolemia. Today, ACL is a valid target since ACL inhibitors have reported positive results in human clinical trials, such as drugs that lower cholesterol. Applications in medicine Hydroxytric acid is a natural ACL inhibitor extract from the Garcinia cambogia that blocks the ACL enzyme by inhibiting the synthesis of new fatty acids and cholesterol. So, it has been used as a dietary substance used to combat obesity in weight loss diets. Pros and cons. The use of HCA not only has physical effects on fat reduction accumulated and decreased weight, but LDL cholesterol reduction in blood equivalent to reducing blood pressure and reducing hyperinsulinemia levels, ideal in patients with obesity problems associated with hypertension and diabetes onset type 2 mellitus. HCA as an extract from the Garcinia fruit is generally well tolerated in adults and occasional gastrointestinal complaints. Issue apply in Ecuador. There are no exact data on these studies in the country. However, recent publications show in Ecuador cardiovascular disease occupy the first places of mortality. In 2014, 23.17% of CVD deaths ranked third cause of mortality in the entire population, second cause in women and fourth in men. Conclusion the genetic variants that mimic the effect of ATP citrate lyse inhibitors and statins appear to lower plasma, LDL cholesterol levels by the same mechanisms of action. They were associated with nearly identical effects on the risk of cardiovascular disease and cancer per unit decrease in the LDL cholesterol levels. Now, some videos about this topic. Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. The heart truth. Heart disease risk factors. We know that if women take care of their hearts and are aware of their risk, they can reduce their chances of developing coronary artery disease. Some of the risk factors that you can control are smoking, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and high triglyceride levels, diabetes and prediabetes, being overweight or obese, being physically inactive, or having metabolic syndrome. The risk factors you can't control include having a family history of early heart disease, being over the age of 55, or having had a history of preeclampsia. Heart health is important at all ages. Having just one risk factor can double your chance of developing heart disease. Two risk factors can quadruple your risk, while having three or more risk factors increases your risk for heart disease more than tenfold. Prevention is key. Here are some steps you can take to improve your heart health. Don't smoke, and if you do, quit. Aim for a healthy weight. Overweight and obesity cause many preventable deaths. Get moving. Try for 30 minutes of moderate intensity activity a day. Eat for heart health. Choose a diet low in saturated fat, trans fat, and cholesterol. Eat plenty of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and fat-free or low-fat milk products. Know your numbers. Ask your doctor to check your blood pressure, cholesterol, and blood glucose. Work with your doctor to improve any numbers that are not normal. Know your family's medical history. Because the heart truth starts with you. 
For more information. Hello, this is Phil Sal, and I'm at the ATBB PBD 2016 scientific sessions where we just finished a session on functional genomics, which, among other speakers, highlighted Dr. Eric Engelson here, who is now coming to us from Stanford University, and just spoke to us about our decade-long experience with GWAS studies, or genome-wide association studies. So Eric, tell us a little bit about what you presented. Right, so um, I've been doing a lot of research in the past uh, five, ten years on um, using genome-wide association studies. That's a method where we look across the whole genome, uh, relate that to different kind of cardiovascular traits, and we found now uh, several hundred loci that are associated with coronary artery disease, other cardiovascular diseases, and, and risk factors for cardiovascular disease. And today I talked about both some of the lessons we've learned from this kind of ten years um, in terms of uh, learning new things about genetic architecture, uh, something about what we've learned in terms of biology and where that's sort of taking us so far. Um, and then I focused much of the talk around um, what, what should we do now and what are the strategies we would use to sort of follow up upon these because it's typically, um, you know, it's one thing to find the association, you find a locus in the genome, but then it's a whole other thing trying to nail down the causal gene and trying to start to unravel the kind of mechanisms. Um, so, so that, yeah, that was uh, what I thought. Great. Obviously, we're still in the early days of this line of research. Uh, maybe you can highlight some of the surprises that we've had over the past couple of years. Right. So, in terms of uh, um, in terms of genetic architecture, for example, there, I think before the human genome projects, especially, but also before the GWAS era, we uh, weren't aware that uh, complex traits had this kind of uh, very polygenetic nature. So there are many loci involved. Each locus has a very small effect. Uh, I think before this whole era, people tended to think that it was going to be much simpler. So it's going to be common variants with large effects. Uh, turned out not to be true at all. So I think that's one of the big revelations. Um, there are certainly other things also about kind of uh, architecture in terms of we know now it's again more complicated than we thought. Allelic heterogeneity, that is several alleles in the same locus have an effect. Uh, and we're also starting to see new things in terms of biology that we didn't know before. Yeah, so that's one of the, probably the most exciting things is mm -hmm. that we're learning more about disease pathways as well as pathways to, to health. Yeah. So. The burning question that everyone has then is when is all this information translatable into care for the patients that are, are stricken by cardiovascular disease? So yeah, that's obviously the most important question. I think it depends on, on um, several things and depends on what, what you want to do with it. I think there are certainly already some examples where we can use genetic information uh, um, to inform um, risk and to kind of uh, select drugs in terms of some pharmacogenomics applications and so there's certainly some examples like that uh, especially actually in other tra in other fields like oncology and hematology um, there are a few examples in cardiovascular disease as well but I think at least to me where I think genomics human genomics is going to be most useful is really finding out new mechanisms uh, informing us about potential new drug targets and kind of moving that in that direction and that obviously will take quite some time. As you know, the drug development pipeline is typically you know, 10, 15, 20 years long. Yeah. So, so it'll still take probably at least a decade before we start to see the fruit of that. That said, we already have a first example in the PCSK9 inhibitors. They exactly. didn't come from GWAS, but they definitely have come from human genetics. Right, and, right. Yeah. Well, exciting times. So thank you for your contributions. Thanks. Prevent disease. And preventing cardiovascular disease is why I went into cardiology. Now, getting people to prevent disease on their own is not an easy thing because it takes hard work even though most of it is free. And there really are four major things that I recommend to patients to prevent a heart attack. One is to eat better. Now, for a lot of people, they think they're eating pretty well and they get a salad and they put ranch on it and some eggs and a whole bunch of cheese. And basically what they've done is transform their salad into a cheeseburger. And that is not a helpful way. Really, it is a low-fat, whole food, plant-based, unprocessed diet. These days, it's actually very easy to do with readily available, inexpensive ingredients. Things like oats for breakfast and brown rice and beans and some vegetables for lunch with a beautiful salsa on top. That kind of a meal is an easy way to do it without a lot of trouble, so that's one. Two is exercise. 30 minutes of brisk activity a day that leads to breathlessness. And if you have orthopedic issues, swim. 
If that doesn't work, bike. Try a recumbent bike. Try an elliptical. If you have trouble with your legs, use an arm bike. Whatever you're able to do to get to breathlessness is the goal. Obviously, check with your doctor first. So that's two. The third thing is stress. So most people don't realize, but stress, especially in Western society, is incredibly high. People have all sorts of stressors from marriage to work to finances, everything. Spend 30 minutes a day, meditate, pray, be introspective, do yoga, whatever you have to do to let things go. Four and final, and this is an interesting one, most heart doctors never talk about love. But why does love associate it with a heart? Because they really go hand in hand. And the data suggests that people who have supportive connections in life, a spouse, a family member, a dog even, they do better. They have less heart attacks. They survive heart attacks better. And believe it or not, there's an emerging field of science in medicine showing this exact thing. So to put it all together in a way that people can really remember, live like a poor crop farmer. Now that may seem strange, but it's pretty simple. Eat what you grow, be active your whole life, be one with the earth, be at peace, and connect to others. That's it. And if you can do that, that is the best way to prevent heart disease. Unfortunately, about one out of every five people present by dying suddenly with heart disease. So this is something that we need to attack before you actually have heart disease. Traditionally, you have men who are over 50 and women who are postmenopausal at risk. People who are overweight, people who smoke, have high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol. Those are the typical people who are at risk. Heart disease is a whole combination of things, including problems with the muscles, such as heart failure, including abnormal heart rhythms. The most common, though, is uh, problems with blocked arteries, which is usually precipitated by a heart attack. It also could be chronic problems like angina, which is uh, chest pain or tightness in your chest. The typical thing that we do for screening is you should have your blood pressure checked regularly. Uh, you should have your cholesterol monitored regularly. Uh, there are certain screening tools that are, are outpatient testing, such as uh, uh, stress tests, which is where you walk on a treadmill or we give medication and monitor your heart uh, to see whether or not you have any blocked arteries. There's a special type of CAT scan we could do, which monitors calcium in your arteries to see whether you're at risk of having heart disease. And we do the diagnostic testing, which confirms that you have heart disease. There's some, what's something called a heart catheterization, which is a test where we inject dye into the arteries of your heart, uh, take moving pictures to see if you have blocked arteries. If that's confirmed, then there are we can do things like stenting, which is when we put a balloon catheter down your artery and open up the artery uh, to restore normal blood supply. Uh, there's bypass surgery, where we, uh, we, we put in special grafts from either your chest or your leg to, to bypass the blockages. Uh, and of course there's medications that we could give you to, to allow the heart to adapt to the blockages and of course there's controlling your risk factors like medications to give you for you to control your blood pressure, your diabetes, uh, your cholesterol. We have a full team of cardiovascular specialists in this hospital who we'll all get together once a week to discuss the patient with heart disease and determine what the best way to treat these uh, patients are. So whether it's surgical, whether it's medication, whether it's a, a stent procedure, uh, so we have, and we also have a, a two highly skilled uh, arrhythmia specialists who, who treat people with abnormal heartbeats or weakened heart muscles to prevent them from dying suddenly. The main thing that people could do uh, on their own, uh, they could to exercise regularly, they could lose weight, uh, obviously stop smoking, uh, take your medications as, as, as prescribed. Those are the, the things that a patient could do. It's, so it's really leading a generally healthy activity. Those should be good for people who not only have heart disease, but people to prevent heart disease from happening in the first place. Nearly 2,500 people will die every day due to heart disease, but it is our lifestyle that is killing us. One reason heart disease is so common is because of this issue of abdominal fat. Abdominal fat is different than fat elsewhere in our body. These fat cells produce molecules or hormones that can go into our genes and turn on bad genes. Turn on a gene for high blood pressure. Turn on a gene for diabetes. Turn on a gene that can disrupt cholesterol metabolism. And when these genes are turned on, it's like a light switch. Boom, we have heart disease. The next thing you know, you're in an ambulance with crushing chest pain being rushed to the hospital. Now in the hospital, there are many life-saving medications, procedures to open those blocked heart arteries. But once the person recovers and returns home, if they do not change their lifestyle, those procedures were merely a band-aid. 
We spend $2 trillion every year on health care, yet 75% of all those expenditures are spent on the results of our poor nutrition and lack of regular exercise. We can do better. We can do better as individuals, and we can do better as a society. Enough talk. Let's go exercise.